Romans 3 12 they are all gone out of the way they are all together become unprofitable there is none that doeth good no not one really you telling me that in the whole world nobody's doing any good <laughs> according to what God is considering good at this time is what he's talking about at this time it's changed from what used to be considered good used to what was considered good was obeying the law now your obedience to the law to prove yourself righteous before God is worth nothing it's only what Jesus Christ does that's considered righteousness Righteousness has all been embedded in one spot, Jesus Christ. That's the only place God looks for righteousness. Now, if Jesus Christ can work some righteousness through you and do a good work, then that's fine. But it's not because of our willpower or know-how. Look at uh, Genesis 4. Genesis 4, verse 3. The typical thing that happens. Man gets the idea that he does the right thing once and he gets he gets an approval from God when you get a pat on the back from God you know it um, somebody's trying to do some special music for us out there <laughs> yeah so yeah so what happens is a man will do right and have a great experience and it's really easy to switch our allegiance from God to the experience and so then man wants to work up the experience. There's a whole denomination based on experience. Mm -hmm. They're called charismatics. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that God doesn't give you some wild and supernatural uh, great feelings from time to time. But don't ever switch your allegiance to the feeling. The God is the one you are pledging yourself to. Genesis 4, look at verse 3. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Now, he's self-righteous. He's bringing something to God. Who does this offering first, Cain or Abel? Cain. I mean, he's on the ball. Abel looks over there and says, Oh, I'm behind the, I'm behind the gun. My brother's already got something going over there. Verse 4. And Abel, he also brought of the first things of the flock of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. That's what happens when man has worked himself to a bone to get the approval of God, and he gets the disappointment of God. He gets angry. <laughs> then he usually goes the other way, just as Cain does. Verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. It's saying here, what Cain had done, according to God, was not considered good. God said, if you do good, you'll be accepted. So all your picking vegetables did God no good. <laughs> he wants meat. God's not a vegetarian. <laughs> I just threw that in there for free. <laughs> he wanted a specific thing. It had to be a spotless lamb, just like he had done for Adam and Eve. Look at it in Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64, verse 6. You won't be saved long before you start attempting to follow God, get in your Bible study, start getting some um, insight from the Holy Spirit, and you have this very thought come to you. Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. That's what happens. Man starts thinking, I can do something. Hey, I did something right one time. Let me duplicate it. No, it's not about you duplicating it. It's about God doing it through you. And that's the switch between the Old Testament and the New. The Old Testament, it was up to you to do something. You had to bring the proper sacrifice. 
if you did some, you did a no-no, you had to find out what, what would cover for that and then offer that. It's all on you. In the New Testament, it's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ and you allowing him to do something through you. Now, the hard part in the New Testament is this. Quit doing. <laughs> Just relax and let him do through you. Now, that sounds simple, but it, it's far from simple. Because the flesh says, no, let me handle this. Let me do this. And God say, no, I, come talk to me. I'll tell you what to do or not to do. Look at it in Romans 3. Romans 3 verse 13. Romans 3 13. I'm going to cover a bunch of verses at once just so we get a context. Romans 3 13. But their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. Bunch of nice guys, huh? How about the Democratic Party here? No, I'm... <laughs> That's where a man goes. He either follows God and gets the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, or that he'll be on that list. There's only two lists. Look at it in Acts 28. Acts 28, 27. Paul's confronting these people and he's saying, look, there's two sides, you've got to pick a side. And he's going to paint one side as it truly is, totally um, degradation. The other side, total righteousness of God. And say, pick one. Total darkness or total light? Choose. Acts 28, 27. For the heart of this people is wax gross. <laughs> I like it. He's, he's naming and claiming it. You know, there's a verse over there that says, uh, to make sin become exceeding sinful. That's our job. Because you know what the world does? The God of this world's job is to blind the minds. So you know what we got to do? We got to rip the blinder off and show sin. I lost my mic. Okay. And show sin to be exceeding sinful as God sees it. Look at uh, Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1 verse 15. I guess uh, my battery's probably dead. Isaiah 1 15. He says, And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear you. Your hands are full of blood. That's man ignoring what God has pointed out. Now, God is good in that this. Think about it. You've just recently found some things God says, Let's work on this. You know what? You had that problem for 30 years before that, and God ignored it. That's how good God is. He'll pick one thing at a time. But if a man won't deal with the one thing God's wanting to work with him on, God says, we're not going a step farther. Because then it would be you leading, not God. Look at it in Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, 9. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So you ask a man, are you basically a good man or basically a bad man? Oh, I'm basically a good man. I said, basically. I said, basically, you're deceived. The Bible says, your heart's job is to deceive you. Ooh. And it does a good job, doesn't it? Because we can... <laughs> We can all find a reason to say we're pretty good. We're better than everybody else we know. <laughs> Titus chapter 1. Titus 1 verse 15. The bad thing is to turn the, the conviction of God off. That's what modern Christianity has done, is it's given you a form of religion with no conviction. Conviction is a good thing. That means God speaking. But most people say, I don't want to go to that church because they make me feel guilty. Well, did the church do it or did God do it? I mean, that, yeah, browbeating somebody doesn't do anything. But God ought to be able to convict us all the time when we go to his word. 
Titus 1 verse 15, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. That's a dangerous spot to get to. We've seen in Romans chapter 1, he said God uses the conscience to wake a man up, to reveal to him good and evil. And when a man has learned to shut out the conscience so he doesn't hear God speak to him, when God doesn't prick his conscience anymore, the man can suddenly start feeling good about himself because he's not hearing conviction anymore. But that's a dangerous spot to be. He says he's defiled his conscience. Romans 3, look at verse 17. Romans 3, verse 17. When a man turns from conviction, he's doing it because he thinks, I'll be better off if I don't feel guilty. <laughs> no, you won't. That's like saying this. If I had no nerve endings in my hand, it would be much better for me because then I wouldn't feel it if I put my hand on the stove. No, but you would smell it because it'd be burning. <laughs> There, just because you feel something that feels bad doesn't mean the feeling is bad. It means the action was bad. Look at it in the verse 17, Romans 3, 17. In the way of peace have they not known. Although they manufactured a fake peace. This fake peace is peace, peace when there is no peace. Mm. You know, professional politician. <laughs> Lie to you. Isaiah 32. You can't have peace, according to God, you cannot have true peace until you have righteousness. Without righteousness, there's no peace because what you've done is you've put up a charade as though you're okay with God. The only way you get peace is when a man, the creator of this whole universe, is okay with you. And if the creator of this whole universe has got a problem with you, then there's nothing you can do that will produce peace. You can produce silence, but that's not peace. Isaiah 32, Isaiah 32, 17. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. Well, there's no peace without righteousness. That's where peace comes from. And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forevermore. Now, if you just go become a hermit to get quietness and not hear anybody and not see any problems, that doesn't give you peace. Righteousness is where peace comes from. And quietness is from God, not from something you work up. Get in James 3. James 3, verse 18. The Miss America standard answer to everything is world peace. You know, that's, that's their, their, their patent phrase. Uh, they don't, they're so clueless, they don't have any answers for anything, so it's all world peace. <laughs> you can't have world peace, and this world will never have peace until it has the Prince of Peace running the show. And he'll be here. And when he does, he comes as righteousness to rule and reign, and that results in peace. James 3.18 And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. How are they going to make peace? They exhibit righteousness. I'm going to kill this thing because uh, it keeps going out. I guess y'all can hear me. Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7 verse 2. Hebrews 7 2. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First being interpreted king of righteousness. This is Melchizedek. His name means first being interpreted king of peace. No, of righteousness. And after that also king of Salem, Jerusalem, which is king of peace. Jeru, that Jah, that's the name for God. That's righteousness. And he says here, Salem, Jerusalem. Salem means peace. The city of peace has not had any peace on it. That's the most contested territory on this earth. However, one day it will truly be the city of peace because the Prince of Peace is going to sit down and rule from there. Romans 3 verse 18. Genesis 3 18. He says, There is no... 
Oh, not Genesis. Romans. Romans 3.18. Romans 3.18. It says, There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, that's where it boils down to. A man's not afraid of God. If a man's not afraid of God, he thinks they're equal. Or, he really thinks this. He doesn't really think they're equal. He thinks he's God. And God will serve his whims. God doesn't serve a man's whims, even if you're a Christian. He's still God. A general description of an unsaved man is this. He has no fear of God. Otherwise, he'd get saved. So, that's a basic that you know about any unsaved man. The reason the lost people don't fear God is because they've got a different father. Their father's the devil. Now, I know it's not so anymore, but growing up, you feared your dad. He was big, he was strong, and he would tell you no, and he would follow it up with something that hurt. <laughs> well, it's the truth in the spirit realm. God the Father, if he's your father, should be feared. Because when he says no, he can follow it up with something that'll hurt you. Now, if you don't fear him, and you're following a different father, your father the devil, then he'll give you the punishment. And you don't want it from him. In John 8, verse 44. John 8, 44. Jesus speaking to the high muckety-mucks here, the, the religious rulers. Who are, they're pretending, they're acting as though that they want to know things. And they, they want to carry on a spiritual conversation with him. He turns to him. Wouldn't you have liked to have been in the crowd and hear him say this? You, you, we all love those hard hellfire damnation sermons as long as it's not talking to us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would like to have been one of the d disciples standing behind him when he gives this speech. I wouldn't want to be in the crowd. <laughs> but here's what he says. Year of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Whew! That's tough. People don't realize that's the way Jesus spoke, but that's the way he spoke. He told it like it was. Now he says Jesus, or Jesus told them that the devil was their father. Obviously not physically. Spiritually, he was their father. You'll find people who try to run this whole thing um, and make a whole uh, alien uh, population. The problem with that is you start getting into Calvinism when you do that. Because some are elect humans and some are non-humans. The seed of the serpent is where that ends up. That uh, the serpent had intercourse with Eve and produced a line of children. So their father was literally the devil. Okay, well, it's obvious here. These people were not all. They didn't all have the same father. He's talking spiritually. Job chapter 41. Job 41 verse 33. You know, tell us about the devil. Job 41 33. Upon earth there is not his like who is made without fear. That is, he, could, he thinks that he can scare everybody and he's more powerful than everybody. That doesn't mean he is. That means he's insane enough to think he is. You've all seen the kid who um, is a little off in the head and runs around as though he's going to be the school bully and gets beat up every time. But he's still going to run around and be the school bully. That's the way the devil is before God. The devil never wins, but he never learns either. He's always going up against him. Job 41, look down at verse 34. He beholdeth all high things. He is a, uh, he is a king over all the children of pride. Now that tells you something about, I would like to say them, but it's us. When pride takes over, pride doesn't mean you're ruling. Pride means you're getting ruled by someone, the devil. 
Christian, one of the Christian's main jobs is to learn to be humble. <laughs> and you'll learn that either by experience or by force. A lot of times you got to force this flesh to sit down and realize it ain't running the show. Don't get the big head. <laughs> Romans 3 verse 19. Romans 3 verse 19. He says, Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith unto them who are under the law. It'd be like this. We have a law in America. You drive on this side of the road. Okay. That's a law. You know, you get arrested if you do it wrong. <laughs> if you don't get any crash first. <laughs> right. Now, let's say we go over to England where it's the opposite. Or even in St. Mark's, I think that's a U.S. property now, a territory, and it's, it's on the other side. It's a holdover state. Well, their law is different than our law. Well, we could be saying, we're Americans, we're going to stay under our law, but in their country, that's not the law. Paul says, the law isn't doing you any good unless you're under the law. He says, it's saying to... Uh, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That tells me something strange people don't understand. You're only set free from the law if you've got a substitute who has completed the law for you in a lifetime. Now think about that. There's no way we could complete the law and you haven't lived a lifetime yet, so you don't know if you did it. <laughs> so you're still under the law as a human, unless you've got somebody who's already done it. We've got Jesus Christ who lived and completed the law for us. He was our substitute. We don't have to be under the law now. We're under him, a new law. Uh, there's no excuse that's going to be had at the judgment seat. It's going to be plain. Here's what the law said. There was a law written in your conscience. We read about that earlier. And God knows it, and he knows the second the man realized it. And he'll pull it up on a big screen. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3 verse 10. Galatians 3 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Oh, that means if you broke one little one. You know, everybody's standard answer is this. I have not ever murdered anybody. I'm pretty good. I mean, that's setting the standard real high, isn't it? <laughs> well, you ask them, okay, so you're, you've identified that Obeying the law is what determines what is good. Let me ask you, have you ever worn a cloth, clothing that was made out of rayon and cotton? You know, that's against the law of the Bible. In the Old Testament, it had to be pure uh, material. You couldn't mix materials. Okay, you broke the law. He says here, if you broke one law, you're guilty of all of them. You are under the law until Jesus Christ sets you free from it. And if you break one of them, even in ignorance, you're guilty. It gets pretty tough, doesn't it? Look down at verse 22, Galatians 3, 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. You got one get out of, no pun intended, hell free card. It's Jesus Christ. You either accept that one or you go pay for it. And the degree to which you'll pay is probably way beyond understanding of man because he's going to pull out the law and he's going to say, here's what the law was. And he's going to say, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Just like the cop does when he pulls you over and you say, I didn't see that speed limit sign. He's going to say, well, there was three of them you passed by. I was going so fast I couldn't see them. <laughs> Romans 3 verse 20. Um, 
Romans 3.20. He says, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. <laughs> if you attempt to complete the law, you suddenly become aware you're weak and worthless. You can't do it. I mean, you'll do it for two or three minutes, <laughs> if that long. And then, before you know it, this flesh has jumped out there and broken it. Wasn't you, it was the flesh. <laughs> Your intention the whole time was to do right all the time. And it just can't do it. Well, that's, that's life. He says, no flesh is going to be justified in his sight. We're not, we're not trying to beautify the flesh. We're trying to make this dead man flesh, this dead skin, move around at the bidding of Jesus Christ. Now that's a different thing altogether. This is also going to show you that um, a child who doesn't have knowledge of sin is not going to hell. Now I know that this is a this is most people understand that. And if you ask a person, does a baby when it dies, a stillborn or whatever, you know, lives three days and dies, does it go to heaven or does it go to hell? Well, they'll tell you that it goes to heaven. Well, okay, what's the basis for it? He says right here in our verse, for by the uh, justified is, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So if the child had no knowledge, then he wasn't a sinner yet. Okay? Uh, the standard Calvinistic answer to that is he's predestined to heaven or hell. So it even they don't think it has anything to do with knowledge. They think God's already decided. No. He's told us the prerequisite right here is knowledge. I have a problem with child evangelism that does this. They take a child and they say, have you ever done anything that was bad? you ever done anything that was wrong? That you knew was wrong? Okay, that means you're a sinner. Okay, that means you've done something wrong doesn't mean you're a sinner. A sinner is when you commit a sin against God and you know you did something God didn't want you to do. That's sin. Against me it can be a transgression. You know, you can hurt my feelings. <laughs> you know, little stuff like that. But against God, it's sin. And that's a serious one. In Deuteronomy, he tells us, you, you saw this verse not long ago, Deuteronomy 139, he says, Moreover, your little ones, which you said should be a prey, and your children which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. Canaan, a picture of us going to heaven. The children get to go in. Why? Because they didn't have a knowledge of good and evil yet. Okay, so a child gets in. There's no uh, sins not given to him. Now, I've got to get... Um, this little thing is going to last me for many pages so I've got to figure out how we break this um, uh, let's see um, Well, we better stop it there. I'll pick up there so that we can stay on this same train of thought. Here's where it's going to go. And you can figure this out for yourself. Um, look at Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 13. Romans 5, 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Okay, so there's no knowledge of the law. Therefore, there's no imputing of sin. So here's the question. This is a heavy-duty question. I think this is an important one because there's a different definition, I believe, of this word than what Americans have. What does imputed mean? <laughs> 